and welcome Mike Shreve. I love all of you. Thank you for being here. And uh, let's lift our voices and let's pray right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for this awesome opportunity and the supreme privilege of sharing your word, sharing the living word of God, the word that is alive, it is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Lord, loose us, loose us from the things that are soulish, like depression and discouragement and fear and lust and selfishness and rebellion and negativity. Let the sword of the word cut down through and loose us, set us free from that which is soulish and that which is sensual, from that which is spiritual and godlike. Let us emerge more in your image tonight for having sat under the canopy of your power and in the presence of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Everybody say amen. amen. Come on, give him a great big praise offering right now. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Tonight I'm going to share with you some fantastic concepts on the mindset of an overcomer. The mindset of an overcomer. What kind of mindset does a person have in order to walk through life as an overcomer? That's going to be our focus. Let's start with the statement that Caleb made when he and Joshua came back after inspecting the land of Canaan. And they came back and reported to uh, Moses. And they said, let us go up at once and possess the land, for we are well able to overcome it. I want you to say that with me, please. We are well able to overcome it. Do you realize what a ridiculous statement that was? By the look on your faces, you're not sure where I'm going. <laughs> If you viewed the situation logically, if you based your assessment on human reason, it was a ridiculous statement to make. We are well able to overcome. There were numerous armies, numerous tribes, numerous uh, cities in the land of Canaan that would resist the Israelites. And those armies had weapons, they had experience, they had training, and the Israelites had none of the above. They were fresh out of Egypt. They had been slaves for over 400 years. They didn't have military training, they didn't have weaponry, and they sure didn't have experience on the battlefield. So, what a faith statement that was. Because when you size it up, when you compare the power of the Canaanite tribes against the power of the Israelite tribes in the natural, in facing each other in conflict, the Israelites should have been easily, easily, easily defeated. But one man looked beyond all of the circumstantial evidence against him, and he said, with his faith upward, we are well able to overcome it because he knew, number one, they were chosen of God to go in the promised land, and number two, sufficient was the supernatural empowerment that God had given them against all the natural opposition. Come on, I'm talking to people right now in this room who are facing conflicts in your life, and you need to go into your promised land. See, all of that is is a symbol of something that you can personalize. That was their promised land, something God said they could have as an eternal possession. But see, you have a personal promised land. It's made up of the written word promises of God. And there's 7,487 <laughs> 7, written word promises. And not only that, some of you, most of you, have living word promises, things that God has spoken to you personally that you're going to accomplish with your life. Things God has spoken to you personally that he's going to uh, do for you or things, situation, he's going to intervene for you uh, and supernaturally. You have these living word promises 
And I challenge you right now to say, let us go up at once and possess the land for we are well able. I said, we are well able to overcome it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Go ahead and praise God. I felt a lot of faith rise in the room. I've often heard it said, it's not how big the dog is in the fight, it's how big the fight is in the dog. And I encourage people all the time to be faith fighters. In fact, let me carry it a little bit further than just encouraging you to be a faith fighter. I challenge you to be a hard-headed, stubborn-willed faith fighter. How many agree with me? You probably won't have problems with the first two parts of that. <laughs> Hard-headed, stubborn-willed. But generate that stubbornness the right direction. See, amazing things can happen when you get very tenacious in faith. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 says, Whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. Or whosoever would be a more proper wording. Whosoever is born of God or whatever, whatever person is born of God, overcomes the world. And would you, repeat, uh, would you read the last part with me? And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Now, you may not feel like you're an overcomer. You may not have this sensational, emotional feeling that makes you feel like an overcomer 24 hours of the day. But when you really understand that you have overcome the greatest arch enemies of the human race that no one within their own power can overcome, then you will understand that you are in an elite class of people that can only get there by the grace of God. See, when you came into this world, you had three strikes against you. You were a sinner by birth, conceived in iniquity and born in sin. The Bible said you were a sinner by nature, transferred from Adam and Eve was a nature of sin that you had to battle as soon as you started knowing the difference between right and wrong. And then you became a sinner by choice. Three strikes. No wonder you came into the world crying. You knew trouble was ahead. <laughs> but you came in here under the curse of sin, a place that is infiltrated by satanic power, Satan and all of his demonic underlings. It's called the valley of the shadow of death because no one gets out of this world without going through the portal of death except the rare exceptions to the rule like Enoch and Elijah. And yet... You people sitting in this room because of your affiliation with the Lord Jesus Christ, because you have been born of God, you've experienced spiritual rebirth, you have conquered sin, you have conquered Satan, you have conquered the spirit of the world, you have conquered the grave even before you face it, you know it will not hold you, praise God. You have conquered hell because you've sent your sins on to the throne of God. And in advance, God has judged that sin and annihilated it and wiped it, wiped it out of existence. In fact, God even said, your sin and your iniquity will I remember no more. Do you realize what a miracle that is for God to forget? It's a miracle for me to remember, but it's a miracle for God to forget. Because God may be old, but he may be the ancient of days, but he doesn't have senior moments. You know, God doesn't go around heaven saying, I, I know I put my keys around here someplace. <laughs> or, 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 yeah. oh, oh, what about, Michael, go down there and bless. Oh, that person's name is on the tip of my tongue. I've known him for years. God doesn't even have lapses of memory. And yet the God, the omniscient God, the all-knowing God who cannot forget has made the decision to forget the sins of your past. Amen. Thank you, Lord. 
and you've overcome sin by your affiliation with him, it has no power over you. Sin has no power over you. Satan has no power over you. The curse of Adam has no power over you. The curse of the law has no power over you. The curse of death has no power over you. The curse of the grave has no power over you. Are you feeling more like an overcomer now? Praise God. Anybody want to give God a shout of praise and bless his name? That's the mindset of an overcomer is becoming positive in the way you look at things. Oh, I could open the floor and you could tell me every negative thing that you're facing in life right now and talk us out of all the victory that's come into the room the last 10 minutes. It's your focus. Your focus is so important. God, God wants you to understand that the victory has already been won. The enemy has already been defeated. The promises have already been given. The character of the one who gave the promises has already been proven. And so you have nothing to worry about. You have nothing to worry about. I said, you have nothing to worry about. The Bible said, be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. I'm talking to an elite group of people, overcomers, the book of Revelation calls you, overcomers. Now to be an overcomer, you have to shift positions. Years ago, I read some quotes from, from a well-known Chinese writer from the sixth century, Sun Tzu. You spell his last name T-Z-U. He wrote a book called The Art of War that is still used in a lot of your military academies, uh, even though it's many centuries old. And, and it, and it uh, shares various strategies for the battlefield. And one thing Sun Tzu taught was that you never enter into a battle with an enemy that is on higher ground. You're ensuring your own defeat. In fact, that's one of the reasons that Lee lost so many times to Grant in the Civil War. is because he was constantly attacking Grant when he and his soldiers were on higher ground. It's just a, a ridiculously foolish thing to do in military conflict. Well, in spiritual conflict, it's just the same. Because, see, before you were saved, Satan was on higher ground. As the prince of the power of the air, as the prince of darkness, as the prince of this world, and he's called all three of those names, he occupied a position of supremacy over your life because you were under the dominion of sin, you were under the curse of Adam, and so legally speaking, he could exert authority and his underlings could exert authority over you. But when you got linked up with the Lord Jesus Christ, Bam! Your position changed in a split second. The Bible said, Given thanks unto the Father who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of God's dear Son. To be translated is to be totally removed from one position to another in a moment of time. And you were removed from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light from a position of inferiority to a position of superiority in a moment's time. You went from the bottom to the top. Now you're not under the dominion of the prince of darkness, but you are seated with Christ in heavenly places, sharing his throne. Hallelujah. How can you even think about being depressed? I'm talking to people that are cultivating the mindset of an overcomer. Let me show you something Jesus said in John chapter 16. And this is going to lay a very good foundation for what I have to say in the remainder of the night. In verse 32, he said, Indeed, the hour is come, and yes, has now come, that you will be scattered, each to his own, and will leave me alone. And yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. Now he's talking to his chief disciples and he's letting them know in advance that he knows they're all going to turn and run. And they all did except for John. And I, I've always thought it was curious that the 11 disciples that tried to save their lives all lost their lives eventually as martyrs. 
But the one that never considered whether they'd kill him or not, he didn't care if he got crucified too. It just didn't matter. Love cast fear out of his life. Love will make you take risks. It really will make you take risks. And he loved the Lord Jesus so much that he was the only one that went all the way to the cross with him. And he was the only one that died a natural death. Isn't that strange? Jesus said, if you love your life, you'll lose it. If you lose your life for my sake, you'll find it. Maybe that's just a coincidence. But I've always thought it was a very unique question. <laughs> but here we are. Indeed, the hour is coming. It is now come when you're going to be scattered, each to his own. And will leave me alone, and yet I am not alone because the Father has sent me. And he said, uh, the Father is with me. And then he said, these things I have spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. What an amazing person the Lord Jesus Christ is. If I knew that my chief disciples that I had invested three and a half years of teaching and training in, in a moment of pressure would all leave me alone, I wouldn't say, I'm telling you these things ahead of time so you'll have peace. I'd really rather none of them have peace. <laughs> you know, if you're going to betray me that way, why, why should you have any peace until you make it right? But that's the way Jesus is. Aren't you glad he's magnanimous in his love? Overwhelmingly, uh, overwhelmingly compassionate and merciful and kind and good and forgiving. He said, these things I have spoken unto you that in me you may have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation. That's a promise. How many of you have had that promise fulfilled in your life abundantly? In the world you shall have tribulation. Would you, would you read the last part with me? But be of good cheer for I have overcome the world. Now there's something amazing about that statement. It's in the past tense. And the world has not thrown its worst at him yet. He hasn't been crowned with thorns yet. He hasn't been beaten in Pilate's Hall yet. He hasn't been whipped. He hasn't been crucified. He hasn't been buried in Joseph's tomb. The world has not thrown its worst at him yet. But see, he knew the Father is with me. He that sent me is with me. Can you say that? He that sent me is with me. You may say, well, Jesus could say that, but I can't. Oh, yes, you can. Because he said, as my father has sent me, so send I you. If he was sent with divine empowerment, divine wisdom, divine guidance, divine intervention, divine undergirding, he was sent into this world not to face things without the Father preparing in advance for every conflict, every battle, every challenge, and supplying sufficient grace in advance to overcome every one of them. If he had a divine and sovereign plan overshadowing him every step of his journey through time, then can you lift your hand and say, I do too. Come on, I, I have a plan of God <laughs> overshadowing my life that's going to come through for me at the most critical moments. I've learned that. One of the ways God makes you an overcomer is by divine guidance. Because he has a way of outwitting the negatives that you're going to face in your future. Because he's already out in the future, he knows what's going to happen, and he has a way of warning his sheep. Please help me preach this, because it'll have more impact if you say it to the person next to you. Turn around and look at them and say, if you'll listen. That's the key element. He will tell you, he will warn you, he will lead you, he will guide you, but you've got to have an awakened ear. He said, he that has an ear, an ear, that's not talking about these ears, it's talking about your spiritual ear. You have two natural ears, only one spiritual ear because you hear with your spirit. He said, he that has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. So a lot is dependent on you. I remember, just to give you a good personal example, many years ago I had driven from Arkansas all the way to West Virginia uh, to hold a revival in a little country church nestled at the base of this big mountain behind it. And I had been traveling, traveling, traveling for weeks and had not had time, quality time with God for a long time. 
And so I decided Monday morning, I preached Sunday, and then Monday morning I thought, I'm going to drive to the church. I'm going to park at the base of that mountain. I'm going to climb up into that mountain to the very top, and I'm going to, I'm going to spend the whole day with God, just reading his word, praying, seeking his face. What could be wrong with that? I didn't even check with God to see if it was his will. I assumed it would be his will. What could be wrong with praying and seeking God all day long in a mountain? And so I got there fairly early and got out of my car, my little Datsun, and, and, and went up the mountain. It took me about an hour and 20 minutes to get to the top of the mountain. I had to climb over barbed wire fences. I had to push my way through thorn bushes. And by the time I got up to the top, I was all scratched up and bloody and my pants were all ripped up, but I was happy to be there. And I sat down in this shady little area under some big trees, opened my Bible and was just ready to relish this time with God. And no sooner did I open my Bible, I heard the voice of my shepherd say, get out of here as quick as you can. I thought, that can't be God. That's got to be my own mind. So I tried to just push it out and read anyhow. And it was like there was a wall between me and the Bible. I could not make the slightest sense out of anything I read. I tried to pray and I felt like the words were just being pushed out of my soul and weren't going anywhere. And I heard that voice again, get out of here as quick as you can. And I pushed it off again and I heard it a third time, get out of here as quick as you can. And then when I heard it the third time, I thought, well, God, why didn't you tell me not to come up here to start with? You know, that would have make it a lot, made a lot more sense for me to get warned at the bottom, and then I haven't wasted an hour and a half coming up here. This, this is not logical. It's got to be my own mind. And then I thought, well, maybe it is God. And maybe God knows something I don't know. Maybe there's a farmer coming around the mountain with a shotgun that doesn't want me on his property. I thought, well, it seems foolish to me, but if God wants me out of here, I'm out of here. So I ran down the mountain. And it only took 20 minutes. I found out it's always easier to go down than to go up. <laughs> Subtle message in that. I ran down the mountain, and at the base of the mountain, I was about to drive back to the motel, frustrated, upset with myself, not upset with God, just up and down, wasting my morning, nothing accomplished. And then all of a sudden, I saw movement up toward the top of the mountain, and it caught my attention because it was a windless day. No trees or bushes were moving, but one great big bush up near where I was at. The limbs were just moving around in a significant way, and I stared at that. You'll, you'll laugh at me. I shouldn't tell you this part. I really shouldn't. But the next thought that went through my mind is, next the bush catches on fire. Whoa, this is my day. Didn't happen like that. But anyway, out from behind that bush came the biggest, ugliest, meanest looking bear I've ever seen outside of a zoo. And he went romping across the side of the mountain and went right into that shady cove where I had been sitting. You know what I did? I got out of my dots and then danced before the Lord. I said, thank you, Jesus, anytime you want to interrupt my plans. You go right ahead, Lord. And then I broke out laughing because I thought, what? What if I had disobeyed God? I thought me and Jonah would have similar problems. <laughs> Different sized bellies, same basic problem. And I thought, I might not have gotten out of that belly. I might still be roaming around the mountains of West Virginia in a digested state. <laughs> Makes me shiver just to think about it. You know, how does that relate to you, though? There's <laughs> stuff just around the corner of life waiting to devour you. There's traps. There's plots. And there's just circumstances that have nothing to do with the enemy that could devour you emotionally and mentally. But your God has made a pledge to be your shepherd. Come on, everybody say, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He leads me beside still waters. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me in paths of righteousness. He's made a commitment to lead you. And if you'll listen, 
He'll take you step by step into the greenest pastures you could ever go into in your life. And I just felt God speak something personally to me. I hope he's speaking to you at the same time. That's how we overcome. We overcome by divine guidance. But there's other things that help us to overcome. We overcome by divine intervention. Where God just shows up on the scene in your life and intervenes in incredible ways. That's what I'm praying will happen for you tonight. I've seen so many impossible situations cured, healed, fixed by an almighty God. When I was at Christian Retreat in Strawberry Lake about 15 years ago, they brought a woman in in the final stages of MS. And two people had to carry her in. She could hardly walk. She could only stay out, out of bed about a half hour a day. The rest of the time she was flat on her back in bed. If she did get out of her bed, she had to crawl on the floor and pull herself with furniture. That's how weakened she was from the disease. She had two canes with her that kind of steadied her as people propped her arms up. And we prayed for her. I didn't know how significant it was. I didn't know her personally, and I didn't know this was an absolute impossibility. But she lifted both of those canes above her head and walked around the room completely healed. Hallelujah. Glory to God. The next day, she had a six-month-old baby she had never picked up. Karen Downing. I don't know if you ever knew Karen and her husband. You knew Karen, okay. She had a six-month-old baby she'd never picked up. And she told me the first thing she thought of the next morning was, was she had to go in and embrace her child. And so instead of falling out of bed and crawling on the floor, she jumped out of bed. And that was amazing enough. And then she went in. She said she put her arms under that child and almost tossed the child over her head because she wasn't used to having that much strength. Then she picked up that child, walked outside and walked, I don't know, it was about a mile down to where her husband was working on a construction project with the baby in her arms. And he thought it was a ghost. He thought his wife had died and was visiting him in a ghostly form because she couldn't even get out of bed, much less walk out of the house. He repented and got right with God. Her two punk rock sons repented and got right with God. The whole family quit their jobs and went to Bible school. Come on. <laughs> Impossibility solved. That's the kind of overcomers that affiliation with God turns people into nothing is impossible oh I know I know that we know nothing is impossible for God that's what the angel Gabriel told Mary concerning Elizabeth having a child in her old age the angel Gabriel said with God nothing shall be impossible everybody say with God nothing shall be impossible I don't think anybody in here has a problem with that but later on in Jesus' teaching, over 30 years later, he told his disciples, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed or uh, a, a, an infinitesimal amount of faith, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you can speak to this sycamore tree and say, be uprooted and be cast into the sea, and it will, be, and it will obey your voice, and nothing will be impossible for you. Now, I know we know nothing's impossible for God, but oh, you move up into a whole new level of faith when you say, nothing is impossible for me. I felt a little reluctance in you. I know there's qualifications to that statement, but I mean, within reason, everybody say, nothing is impossible for me. If I have faith as a grain of mustard seed, I, I can speak to the sycamine tree. What does the sycamine tree represent? Just any battle or problem in your life? I'm sick of mine. Are you sick of yours? <laughs> ah. Little play on words there. The mindset of an overcomer is the mindset of a person that speaks faith in the face of disaster. You speak victory when everything testifies against it. Oh, I wish I had time to tell you some more personal stories. Amazing. I'll tell you one that's not my own experience, but the experience of the uncle of a young man that used to work with me. Do you remember David Cooley that used to do worship for me? We came to, he came to Christian Retreat a couple of times. But anyway, his uncle at one time pastored a church in North Carolina called the Ark Methodist 
church, A-R-K, the Ark Methodist Church. What a peculiar name for a church. Why did they name it that? Because of its very sensational and amazing history. Let me go back to the beginning. There was a group of saints that didn't have much money, but they had a big vision. Big vision, not so much provision. And so they had a, an agreement from a businessman in town. They wanted to build a church. And they had enough money to buy the materials, but not enough money to buy the parcel of ground, the real estate they wanted. And so they went to this businessman who owned it, and they said, we're going to take six months to build the church out in so-and-so's field, and then we'll raise money over that time to buy your property, and then we'll move the church on a big wagon and set it down on blocks right here in the center of town. Do you agree to that? He said, yes, I'll reserve that property for you. It was just an oral agreement. Be careful of oral agreements. <laughs> And so they raised money for six months, built the church, came back to the man. He said, I'm sorry, I've changed my mind. I'm going to use that property for something else. He would not budge from his stance. He said, I'm going to use that property for something else. But see, saints are in touch with a higher power. They've got pull. They've got friends in high places. Praise God. And they got down to business praying to the only thing that is unchangeable. The God who said, I am the Lord, I change not. And everything else in this world is subject to change, especially when he gets involved. And they prayed and sought God and prayed and sought God, make a way, that's prime property, that's exactly what we want for the success of your kingdom, like the property you want. I'm praying the same kind of divine intervention. Praise God. Oh, I felt a witness. My, my, I felt a witness go through here right then. God sent a flood. Now, I don't think God's behind all natural disasters. I hope I don't offend any insurance people in here, but I've always gotten highly captivated uh, and, and, and amazed by that little statement on most insurance policies that uh, this covers certain acts of God, like hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes, et cetera, et cetera. Like all God's got to do, all he uses his spare time for is causing disruptive things happening in the planet Earth. I mean, a tornado, a hurricane, that's God at work, hallelujah. I don't think that's always the case at all. God's a healer. God fixes things. He doesn't tear them up. But in this particular case, I believe God got involved. And there's a little plaque that tells the story when you come into this community in North Carolina. They've even got flood marks on the building showing how high the water got. It got up about this high. It went through that whole community. And no other building floated except, guess which one? The church. It floated about two miles, made a couple of definite turns, and the flood water set it down, guess where? Right on the property that they'd wanted all along. Hallelujah. Wait on the Lord and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say on the Lord. Well, that businessman came out and the saints came out. You know how saints are when they get an answered prayer. Woo! Glory to God. Hallelujah. Shouting, praising God. They came over to him and said, you are going to sell us this property now, aren't you? Can't you see? We're supposed to have it. You are going to sell it to us now. He gave them a very grim look and he said, I am more convinced than ever. I refuse to sell you this property. Then he broke into a smile and he said, if God wants you to have it this much, I'm giving it to you. I am signing over the deed right now. You could handle a divine intervention like that, couldn't you? Praise God. Come on, that's my God. That's my God. He does amazing things for people when they pray. That's why we can have the mindset of an overcomer because we know nothing takes our father by surprise. May I say that again? Nothing takes your father by surprise. He knows everything you're going to face. And, and 2 Timothy 1, 9, this is the most wonderful church. I have never been to a church where they had back supports for everybody in the church. <laughs> 
That is awesome. But uh, that totally took my mind away. Where in the world was it? Oh, 2 Timothy 1 9. 2 Timothy 1 9 says, God has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which were given to us, past tense now, which were given to us in Christ Jesus. Huh? Before the world began. You mean before, well, in the King James it says world. And here it's New King James says time. Before time began, before the world began, before this world was spinning on its axis, before you even existed, before Adam and Eve even existed, God anticipated that you would be alive in this era, in this generation, living where you live, facing what you face, doing what you do, and God gave you a purpose in Christ before the world began, and God gave you grace to fulfill it. God gave you grace to go through every valley, to climb every mountain, to achieve every challenge he's ever placed in your path, to overcome every obstacle. You will never get to a place in your life where the grace runs out. You will always have sufficient grace because God is able to make all grace abound towards you and I dare you to lift your hand and say I've already got it I, I already come on confess I've already got it I don't have to ask for it because he gave it to me before I ever got here I'm going to talk to you for just a few minutes about the power of the past prophetic tense because I just gave you two scriptures, John chapter 16, verse 33, and this one here, that indicate some things transpired in the mind of God, in the plan of God, in the purpose of God long ago, many, many ages ago, so that you wouldn't come up short. Let me take you to 1 John chapter 2, verse 14. Only the last part of the verse is going to occupy our attention, but watch it here. He says, I have written to you, young men. Now, I believe this is applicable to the ladies too, so kind of ignore that. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong. And would you read the next phrase? And the word of God abides in you, the written word. The word of God abides in you. And what tense is that? Is that future tense, present tense, or past tense? past tense, and you have overcome the wicked one. Well, wait a second, before I face some kind of satanically spawned battle next week, next month, next year, can I dare to say I already have overcome the wicked one? Yes, because the word of God abides in me. The word of God. And as I mentioned the other night, there's 7,487 promises in God's word. And those promises are so across the board. They, they present a full spectrum of all the kinds of situations you might face in life and the divine solution given in advance. And there is nothing that you will face in life where God doesn't already have a promise positioned in this book, strong enough, powerful enough, mighty enough to push you through the problem, to sure victory on the other side one way or the other. You may not always get what you want, when you want, the way you want, in the manner you want, but one way or the other, you're going to come out shining like the sun in the kingdom of your father. Do you believe Believe that. So I already have overcome the wicked one just because of the written word. But it gets better. It gets better. Go with me to 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. Back when I was part of a deliverance group that went overboard, I mean, we, we went overboard. We had a list of 150 devils we'd cast out of people every night. 
They were all back in the next site. We'd have to go through the whole thing again. Uh, <laughs> but in order to test if someone was really delivered, we'd speak to them and say, say Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. Because we thought that's what this was encouraging us to do. But that's not even what this passage is about. It's not a test to see if someone is free from demonic influence. Please, this is ringing just a little bit. If you could turn it down just a hair, I'd appreciate Just a hair. Just pull one out, brother, and measure. That's dangerous, I know. But uh, anyway, this was about a false doctrine that was opposing the church in that day, out of Gnosticism. The Gnostics taught that Jesus was not a real man. He was a phantom. He was a spirit being that assumed a form that appeared to be physical, but was not really physical. That he never really came in the flesh. He was a phantom. And because he never really came in the flesh, he never really died on the cross. That was all like a dramatic put on, but it didn't really happen because he didn't really die. And because he didn't really die, he didn't really rise from the dead. And that was a predominant heretical belief in that day. And John is dealing with that heresy. He's saying anyone that says Jesus did not come in the flesh is not of God. Don't listen to that kind of teaching. But then in verse 4, now any spirit, any demon is an antichrist spirit because the word antichrist means against the Messiah. Christ is the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew Messiah. Mashiach is the original Hebrew. And anything that is anti-Christ or anti-Messiah is against God, against the revelation of God, against the purpose of God. So all demons on one level or another are anti-Christ spirits and all of those deceiving spirits will reach a peak of expression in that one man who will be an antichrist attempting to rule the world in these last days. I admit that. So it's covering a lot of territory. He said antichrists are already in the world. These spirits are already running rampant. But he did say in verse 4, would you read it out loud with me? You are of God, little children. And what? What tense is that? Past tense. You have overcome them. Why? Because he that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. Or greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Let's personalize it. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. The first quotation out of John's letter that we read said we have overcome the wicked one because the word of God, the written word, abides in us. Now he's telling us that the living word, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, who was the word made flesh that he abides in us and because Jesus in me will not be overcome by anything I face in my future listen when he hung on the cross he was at his weakest moment and the devil was at his strongest moment but even when he became sin for us on the cross and the spirit departed from him and he cried my God why have you forsaken me even in that critical moment Jesus at his weakest moment was stronger than than the devil at his strongest moment and Jesus oh my I felt that witness again Jesus in you is stronger than the enemy can ever be at his strongest moment in your life come on you ought to you ought to take the helmet of salvation and pull the mindset of an overcomer over your thinking processes got one more passage of scripture mm, I love this don't be afraid of anything somebody told me I, I I think it was the pastor told me, somebody here, you had a witch today trying to put hexes on you or spells on you. Don't worry about that. They don't have any power over you. I have a friend. I want him to the Lord. He was David Wilkerson's uh, children's leader for many years. He moved to New York City with his wife. And uh, they called me about four or five days later and said, Brother Mike, Brother Mike, you've you got to pray for us. I said, why? They said this lady moved in the flat next to us. I don't know why they call apartments flats. Well, of course they're flat. But anyway, <laughs> the, this lady moved in the flat next to us, and we know she's a witch. I said, why do you know that? Because when we come out of our apartment in the morning, there's satanic symbols and witchcraft symbols in white powder right in front of our door. And we know she's calling down spells on us. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? I said, do you have any gospel tracks? Oh, yes. Brother Wilkerson loads us down with gospel tracks. I said, tonight about midnight, 
spread some gospel tracts in front of her door in a nice Christian symbol. I got a phone call four days later. I said, how's it going? He said, no more white powder. <laughs> she moved out. Praise God. Hallelujah. Oh, come on. Overcomers, 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 overcomers. I got to take you to Revelation chapter 12. The final conflict where Satan is cast down. If anybody ought to be cast down, it's the devil. And I've talked a lot more about the devil than I normally do tonight. I usually don't even mention it. It's not worth mentioning. I talk about the Lord Jesus Christ, but this particular message has required it because of the passages that I'm dealing with. But see, the great dragon, isn't it strange how it started out a serpent and becomes a dragon in the end? Only by influence over people has he grown in size and influence. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. Think of that. No one has ever come into this world that has not been subject to his deceptive influence one way or the other. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. There was war in heaven, the previous verse says. There was war in heaven. Next verse. Think of this. War in heaven. Have you ever wondered how angels and demons fight? They don't fight with guns or bows and arrows or spears or swords or hand grenades. How do they fight? With words. You read it. When Moses' body was laying in between Satan and Michael the archangel, how did Michael fight the devil who wanted Moses' body? He said, the Lord rebuke you. He fought him with faith-filled, power-filled words. And the way you're going to win the battle tonight is by faith-filled, power-filled words. You're going to declare, I am free. I am delivered. I am healed. I am prospered. I am set free. I will succeed. I have a God who lives inside of me who will propel me forward to victory in every circumstance. Praise God. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven when the devil does his best to destroy then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. Let the devil be cast down. I refuse to be cast down. Praise God. But look at the next verse. This is the one I'm leading you, leading you to. What tense is that? Future? Wait a second. This was written nearly two millennia ago. Almost 2,000 years ago, John wrote these words, delivered to him from God. He saw the last days. He viewed what would happen at the close of the age. It's two millennia in front of him, and yet he puts it in the past tense. So sure is the victory of the church of the living God that he puts it in the past tense. He says, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb by the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives unto death. I'm going to close with this story. Many years ago, around 1985, I had a visitation of the enemy. I woke up one morning, God is my witness, I woke up one morning and Satan himself was standing at the foot of my bed. He didn't look like he's supposed to look, he did not have shiny red skin. He did not have a pitchfork. He didn't have a tail with a little pointy end to it. In fact, quite the contrary, he looked very dark, swarthy, handsome, tall, slick back black hair, long black cloak. There was an air, somewhat of an air of dignity or an imposing air about him. But the thing that gave him away was his eyes. His eyes were so deep with evil. It was like it was an abyss of evil in his eyes and so penetrating. His eyes were penetrating me to the core of my being and his eyes were saying, I'm going to ruin you. I'm going to wreck you. I'm going to destroy you. I was paralyzed. I couldn't, I couldn't move. I couldn't even open my mouth. I, 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 was, I, I was under this tremendously evil presence. And then, praise God, the Holy Spirit came to my rescue. And when I, my mind was spinning wondering, how can I respond to this? That all of a sudden the Holy Spirit rose within me. I never opened my mouth, but in the vision, I heard the sound of my own voice 
rebuking the devil and I said I conquer you Satan through the precious blood of Jesus it is impossible for you to win I didn't coin that phrase the Holy Spirit gave that as an inspired word it is impossible for you to win up until that point the devil had this smirking arrogant grin on his face but when I mentioned the blood Honestly, a look of utter terror spread across his countenance. And I knew then I had the upper hand. I was on higher ground. Hallelujah. I said, I was on higher ground. And that's when the Holy Spirit rose within me again and said it a second time. I conquer you, Satan, through the precious blood of Jesus. It is impossible for you to win. And again, God is my witness. Like a candle melting, his eyes started melting into his cheeks. His cheekbones started melting down into his neck. That's when I felt this tremendous surge of authority. And I said it louder, even though I never opened my mouth. I heard my own voice shouting twice as loud. I conquer you, Satan, through the precious blood of Jesus. It is impossible for you to win. And when I said it the third time, he faded away into the blackness and darkness and has never been back in that manifest way since. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. So it's not enough to just have the blood on your life. You have to testify. And let me tell you something about the blood being on your life. I hope you understand that, the way it needs to be understood. Because I had a totally false concept about that for many years. I had well-meaning saints tell me, if you ever have a problem, if you go through a mental battle, if you go through an emotional battle, if you have a spiritual conflict, claim the blood. Well, that was partially right and partially wrong. Because the way they communicated it, I would, I would say, I claim the blood as if I'm pulling this covering down over myself. And then a half hour later, I'd go through another spiritual conflict in my mind. And again, I'd say, I claim the blood. Well, what happened to that first application? Does it evaporate after 15 minutes? Huh? And I did that for years. I claimed the blood. I claimed the blood just without even thinking about it. I would say it numerous times from time to time and yet it was probably 12 or 13 years before it dawned on me that Jesus didn't say I had a dried covering of blood on the outside of my spirit he said except you eat my flesh and what drink my blood you have no life in you Wow whatever you drink becomes inseparably a part of you if you drink a glass of orange juice five days later, you can't poke a hole in your arm and out squirts the orange juice. It blends in with you uh, because the digestive juices in your stomach break it down into the necessary nutrients and then spread it to every cell in your body so that you are what you eat. That's why I'm very careful. I've read the packages. I don't eat bologna. <laughs> you are what you eat. Beef lips, hog snouts, no thank you. <laughs> But if you, let's bump it up to a spiritual sphere. If you eat his flesh and drink his blood, then it flows into you, mingles with you, becomes very much a part of you. And from the point of your salvation forward, just like natural blood flows through your circulatory system constantly, the spiritual blood of the Lord Jesus Christ flows through your spirit constantly. You may say, well, you don't claim the blood. Oh, yes, I do, but in a totally different mindset. I claim the blood of Jesus, not as if I'm pulling it to myself, but to affirm that his precious blood is always there. It's flowing through me constantly. And every second that the blood flows through me, I'm being cleansed all over over again sanctified all over again purified all over again empowered all over again set free all over again come on somebody say the blood be upon me the blood of Jesus flowing through me right here tonight makes me more than a conqueror through him who loved me I think it's time to praise God I think it's time to praise God. I think it's time to praise God. I think it's time to receive from God. Can we lift our voices and begin to praise God with all of our heart and with all of our soul and with all of our mind and with all of our strength? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.